Well, good morning. If you have a blue Hyundai, if you could hit your unlock button, that would really help us. Since the alarm's going off right in front of the door there. Oh, she's running away. Sorry, you didn't have to run away. You probably could hit it. Oh, it happens, yeah. Well, good morning. So Jenna made me... By the way, if you don't have an ugly sweater, you can make your own. Jenna did this for me. And I actually did not put the ugliest ornaments on here because what people don't realize is that the ugly ones are my favorites at the house. I have, and by the way, here's the back. So Jenna just flew in. She flew all night last night, so hopefully you'll get to see her next weekend, and she'll be here. Today we're going to talk about ugly words, and uh, you know, it's funny because uh, when we hear Christmas is more, which is what I'm going to put on the sign after church today, uh, Christmas is perhaps something more. You know, the truth is, for many of us, if we're not careful... Uh, we get lost this time of year focusing on the wrong things and uh, either trying to get something for somebody or focusing on a loss this time of year. This is hard for so many people, uh, focusing on a struggle. And uh, so the truth is, as we look at this idea of words, I really, I want to encourage you this time of year to recognize the power of your words And we're going to look at the Christmas story. We're going to look at Luke chapter 2 today. And we're going to look at three different way words were used in this story. And uh, I want to help you to move from words of doubt, uh, then to words of faith, and then to go beyond that to even blessing other people with the power of your words. Um, I love Christmas trees. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, the early Protestant reformer, was one of the first ones to bring Christmas trees inside. By the way, I always laugh because people have these arguments about whether something was pagan or Christian. And I always laugh because I'm like, you know, God created the tree, right? So he had it first. So if somebody stole it in between, it's okay for Christians to steal it back. Uh, You know, they do that with eggs and everything. Eggs are a pagan symbol. Didn't God create the egg? I thought he was first. So anyway, just because somebody stole it. But uh, in the early times, I'm going to steal your pink candle. Uh, In the early times, uh, Christmas trees, you ready for this? They would actually put real candles on a Christmas tree. I wouldn't even do that to a fake Christmas tree. And I don't know if you know much about fire, but I do. So if my insurance agent would not listen for a moment as I tell this next story... um, right before the hurricane, I had a tree that was really big and it was aimed at my house. And I'm not brave enough to cut one down that can actually hit something important. And so I hired a guy, he came out and cut the tree down and uh, I was gone. And so he actually took the tree, cut it up and piled it up in my, uh, I have a fire pit out in my yard and uh, we're allowed to burn, limited burning out there. And so he piled it up and normally I make my own pile. I didn't make this one. Uh, and I had been told something years ago that I finally got to see in practice. And that is that a tree that is struck by lightning is extra flammable. It like becomes kerosene apparently. And uh, so I went out with just, a, with just like a match pretty much. One of those little lighter things. I put a little lighter fluid on the bottom of the pile and I lit it, and I thought, I wonder if that's going to go, oh, oh, that's, that's pretty significant. I ran to get the hose, I run over to get the hose, I'm turning the hose on, grabbing the hose, I got one of those hose that gets smaller, which means that it has not, I don't know if you knew this about that, that means that it puts out about enough water uh, as a squirt gun, because whatever they do to make it do that means it doesn't actually gives you very little water. So anyway, so I'm getting the hose and going out, and Kristen goes, hey, that fire looks pretty big. I'm like, yeah. She's like, I, I think that's not, uh, in, I, it looks bad, like not in control. I go, I know I'm getting the hose. She goes, I, I think you need to take care of that. You're not helping. <laughs> so I'm running out there. I now have this 20, don't listen. I now have this fire that's hit, hitting the air. I'm looking at the trees near it and thinking, 911. I'm going to have to call the police, the fire department. Which, by the way, I had to call the next week, but that's another story for another day. And uh, yeah, my neighbor who lives across the street from us thinks the stories are funny, except that now he's involved in them. And so 
He had tape in his yard last week that said, life danger in his yard. He said, I've never had that before. Said, yeah, welcome to my neighborhood. Anyway, so um, he's probably watching online. Anyway, so, um, so this, he doesn't know this story either. So, so flames are shooting up. I get this little water hose and I'm literally looking at the flames going, okay, if they light, if it get anything else, I'm calling the fire department. I don't know what else to do. And uh, so I'm spraying it. I have no idea how, but I got the fire under control, and then I decided I'll just put it out, and, uh, and I got the fire totally out. But can I tell you that just a little bitty spark, that fire just took off, and here's the thing that you and I don't understand about the power of our words. We say words all the time, and we don't think much about what we're saying, and here's the other part of that. We also don't think much about what we're listening to and what we're taking in. So I want you today to recognize the power of your words. And, and here's the thing, too. I want you to learn what I'm going to talk about today. So we're going to look at, at three different people in this story and the things that they said. And I'm going to try to encourage you to move towards, to move towards the third person in these stories in uh, Luke chapter 1. Number one, words of doubt bring disappointment. So this is a really cool story. You've got a guy in the temple. He's actually inside of the holy place. Um, they would actually tie a rope around the priest before he would go. And they had bells on there. So if they quit moving for very long, they would just yank him out of there. Because, you know, in the Old Testament, there was a guy who touched the Ark of the Covenant and died. He was, like, trying to keep it from falling, like doing something good. Like, I'll help. And he's dead. So they were, you know, very nervous. They weren't going to go in there. And here's what happens. Then an angel of the Lord, this is to Zechariah appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. So he's, he's lighting incense. He's, he's lighting uh, uh, what was probably uh, frankincense, by the way. And he's lighting this, and, and uh, all of a sudden an angel appears. All right? Remember, they don't have fade in. When Zechariah, which means God remembers, by the way, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, what angels always say, unless they don't like you, do not be afraid. Only one time in the Bible does an angel not say, don't be afraid. It's Balaam. When he appears to Balaam, he says, be afraid, be very afraid. I was going to save your donkey and kill you. That was awesome, like sarcasm from a, an angel. Anyway, so don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. What prayer? So could have been two things. He might have been praying for a child as an old man or praying for the Messiah. What he didn't know is he's part of both. So here's what comes next. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you're to call him John, by the way. And then he goes into talking about how John is the predecessor to Jesus. He's going to pave the way for Jesus. We know that whole story, John the Baptist, and you can look all that up later. And so he's going to prepare the way. And then a few verses later, here's what happens. So Zechariah asks the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man. Now, first of all, he's saying to the angel, how do I know what you're saying is true? Can I just encourage you not to call an angel a liar if he appears in your house? Like if we're here in church all of a sudden and all of a sudden you're like, boof, and there's an angel here, the first words out of your mouth should not be, I don't believe it. Okay, it's like the ghost of Christmas past, right? You don't believe it. Next thing you know, he's crashing lock boxes together or something or whatever they do. All right, so if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you need to read more. All right, so the angel said to him, okay, so he said, I'm an old man. Now, he was dumb with the first thing he said, but he's really smart with what he says next. He says, I'm an old man. And he could have said, and my wife's an old woman. But he was smart enough to say these words instead. And my wife is well along in years. <laughs> so the guy's not a genius, but he's not a dummy either. Apparently he has better wife skills than he has angel skills. Right? I'm an old man. She's got a lot of years. Right? Okay. So then it continues. The angel says this. And you can almost hear the exclamation point in this sentence. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you. 
and tell you this good news. I bring you, I'm bringing you good news. You should be excited about this. It's like giving your kids a present on Christmas and they play with a box. Right? And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. And of course, we know John the Baptist would be born. And so Zechariah is there. He goes outside. Uh, the people know something's happened. I'm guessing he's doing, you know, pantomiming when he came out. He's probably doing the angels in the outfield thing. Right? I don't know what he... I don't know how you sign Gabriel. It went around the whole stadium. Why did he get in trouble? And in a minute, we're going to see Mary doesn't. Because he doesn't believe God. Because he says, God, you can't do that. Here's what I want to challenge you with. Begin changing what you say and what you think about what God can do. Quit saying, this is just the way I am. Quit saying, this is just the way they are. And start saying, you know what? I know God can even do that. I know God can even... Now listen, we've got to cooperate with Him, correct? We, we, we've got to cooperate with God. God's not just going to force us to do what He's called us to do. He never forces anybody. To give up a bad habit. He never forces anybody to walk through difficulty. But he will walk with you. And so we say, with God all things are possible. God, I know you can do this. But I'm an old man. And my wife has a lot of years. If he had instead say, well, I don't know how this is going to happen. But you're an angel, so I'm guessing it's true. Instead, he's like, I don't believe what you just said to me. I mean, he's in the place with a rope tied around his leg in case he's struck dead. You would think you would have a little more reverence. But he was so overwhelmed weighing what he saw as facts against what God could do. And he said, I'm not sure God can do that. Is there anything you think God can't do? Is there any situation you think God can't deal with? Now, I will tell you the truth. God doesn't always deal with things the way I want him to. I like to tell God how he should deal with things. God, you could fix this right away. And Lord, it'd be nice if you just take that person out. That would just make life easier. <laughs> Only if they're in the left lane. What? What? You ever have a rogue wave in your life? Everything seemed to be going well. Did you hear an American was killed by a rogue wave to a cruise ship just this weekend? A rogue wave. Somebody, the, this ship was headed to Antarctica. I, by the way, I know somebody who just came back from that trip. Rogue wave hit the side of the boat, went through the windows, injured several, killed one American. A rogue wave out of nowhere. Listen, we've all had those moments in life where we get a phone call. We get a text. We get some news. Maybe even, listen, we're just going through life and all of a sudden our thoughts are a rogue wave. Like you're having a great day and all of a sudden a memory you haven't had in years. And at that point you have to say, God, I'm going to trust you. I don't know how you're going to fix this. God, I don't know how you're going to deal with this, but I know that you're going to help me walk through it. And I'm going to trust you through it. Take time to give thanks for God's power. One of the things that will help you as you're going through something that seems impossible right now. Is to look back and see what God made you through. How many of you are here this morning? Would you just raise your hand if you're here this morning? I just, some of you are halfway. Okay. I, I want you to know, I know you're here. You ready? Because you made it through something. And you may have made it through something you didn't think you'd make it through, but you're here. So there's something you can look back on and say, God, you helped me through that. And I didn't think I'd make it through that. You can help me through this. I want to encourage you. 
Begin recognizing God's power in your life. I love this quote by Bill Crowder. The great challenge left to us is to cut through all the glitz and glam of the season that has grown increasingly secular and commercial and be reminded of the beauty of the one who is Christmas. Do you know Christmas is named after somebody? Just shocker, right? Christmas. Okay. Number two, words of faith overcome uncertainty. Do you remember when you were a kid, they said, sticks and stones may break my bones? And now they say something different. Do you know what they say now? But words can really hurt me? Is that something like that? When we were kids, we were told words couldn't hurt you. What a bunch of liars. I mean, I I told these little kids about something that happened in sixth grade. I'm old. I'm really old. When I was in sixth grade, I was put on a racer duty. You know what a racer duty? You don't even know what a racer duty is. How many of you know what a racer duty is? Yeah, that was the best. I was on a racer duty because I was the most hyper kid in class, and I got to go outside and bang the erasers together and cover myself and look like a math teacher when I came back in. Back in the old days. And yet I still remember that. Almost all of us can remember, especially some painful thing that happened to us, sometimes silly. Like we even know as adults that's silly. It's silly what Sally Isaacs said to me 40 years ago. By the way, you can control what you say. You know how I know? Because I have a country mama. And in the old days, we had a phone that hung on the wall. I know you haven't seen that. Not the kind you wound up. I'm not that old. Okay. So, and we had more than three numbers. Although my mom used to work for a switchboard. That's another story for another day. But anyway, so I know because my mom would be, my brother and I were teenagers And my mom would be giving us a talk. You boys better calm down. You quit. Clean up your rooms right now. Bring, bring, bring. Hello. (laughs) Yes. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll be there. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, honey. Okay, sweetie. Okay. See you later. Now, listen. (laughs) How many of you ever had that experience with your prayer? Right. Okay. And, and yet we say, I couldn't help myself. And it's a lie. Because you type differently to some stranger on Facebook than you type to your boss. Unless you're tired of working where you work. Right? Isn't that amazing? But the angel said to her, so this is Mary. The angel appears to Mary in, in Luke 1 verse 30. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You're to call him Jesus. He'll be great. will be called the son of the most high. The Lord will give him the throne of his father, David, and he'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Now, you have to realize that's even a bigger miracle than what he said to Zechariah. And listen to what she says. It's very different. You may not see the difference, but listen. She says, uh, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She doesn't say, you can't do it. She says, could you give me a little insight into how this is going to happen? Which is what we pray all the time. I want you to hear what the angel says, and then I'm going to tell you something that maybe you didn't notice. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child. And the angel's not as nice as the husband in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. And then he says this, for no word from God will ever fail. Time out. (laughs) He just explained what's going to happen. We don't understand this today. This is something that theologians wrestle with. How how does this work? So don't you think Mary just kind of went, uh-huh, okay, Uh, I guess we'll figure it out. So we think she knew what was going on, but the truth is that the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. I have no idea what that means. And theologians today are like, "Mm, we don't, yeah, it sounds good. We know it's true. We just 
And listen to what Mary says. This is your life. Listen. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What does she say? God, I surrender to whatever you want to do. That is a prayer of faith. When's the last time that you had to say to God, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. God, I don't know how you're going to work this out. I mean, you just told me. I mean, even if God told you how he was going to work it out, you'd be like, okay. I guess we'll find out tomorrow. And most of us aren't that smart. We wouldn't remember anyway, so it's good. James 1, 5 and 6 says what you should do. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously without finding fault, and it'll be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. So let me encourage you when you're struggling in conversation with people. Begin to say, God, show me how to talk to that person. God, give me wisdom. I have a teenager, Lord. I need help. Isn't it amazing how good prayer lives get with teenagers, isn't it? Right? God, I don't know how to talk to them anymore. It's like whatever I say, they go. Ah. Oh. Like I've embarrassed them. I'm sorry, I asked you to clean out the dishwasher and ruined your life. You were in the middle of a Netflix series. I mean, just, oh, got to be tough for you. I mean, we were kids, we had to take the garbage out and you'd miss the whole show. And there was no rewind. Anyway, I'm sorry. Like my life was so tough, right? I did a wedding renewal yesterday, 25 years. And I said to them, I said, you are kind to each other. I said, don't get lazy. Continue to be kind to each other. You can be loving towards other people. <laughs> hey, if nothing else, treat them like your boss. And, and here's the thing. Too many marriages and too many friendships become business partnerships. Cut it out. Don't just call people when you need them to do something. Text them and say, hey, I hope you're having a good day. I appreciate you. Thanks for all you do. Just like I told those kids, tell somebody what you like. Send somebody a text. It can be random. Just send somebody a text. Hey, care about you. By the way, I texted somebody during the church service. They'll read it later. And I'm the pastor. If you didn't notice. Here's a second challenge. In uncertain times, use words of faith. Now, how is the pastor going to do point three in three minutes? It's going to happen. Number three, words of blessing bring inspiration. Years ago, I had a sailboat. I was out on my mom's lake at that time. I was sailing, and I turned the rudder pretty sharp. And my brother-in-law from shore said, now, I don't know if you've ever watched a college game. They use aluminum bats. He said, all of a sudden, I looked out. And he said, and it sounded like a home run in college baseball. Because you turned that thing, and that aluminum boom came across, caught you in the back of the head, and threw you right out of the boat. And the boat just kept going. And he saw me swimming. I don't know why I'm swimming like this, but apparently I was. <laughs> what happened? I turned it too sharp. Listen, your words, if you're not careful, you will say the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong way. And guess what? Ah! You'll wish you had never said it. The Bible says, your words, our tongue is like a rudder. And it can turn sharp. So be very careful. Because you can't take back the things you said. You can say whatever you want. But those, those things stick. And they sting. And you can apologize. And you can try to make it right. But anger is like pouring gasoline on roses. You can put all the fertilizer you want on it afterwards. But guess what? You've got some replanting to do. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you'll bear. And then she says this, listen to this. If we treated people like this, wouldn't it be great? But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Because I'm your cousin? What? No, I'm favored because you're around me. What if we treated other people with that? Why am I so favored that I get to hang out with you? What if we really acknowledged other people? Why am I so blessed that I get to be your friend? Why am I so blessed that I get to be married to you? Why am I so blessed that I get to be a part of your life? 
And then she says, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who's believed that the Lord will fulfill her promises to her. And then Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord. And you can read this great song, psalm, prayer that Mary, the most famous prayer that Mary makes. Why? Because she was so inspired and so encouraged by her friend, it led her to glorify God. Listen, if you will go out of your way to bless people, if you go out of your way to encourage people, if you go out of your way to inspire people, then people in your presence, like the baby, will jump for joy, like Mary will be encouraged, and you can actually help other people to walk through difficulties and trials and struggles. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says this, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you're doing. I want you to look for ways to bless others with words. Now, this was a poem that was given to me years ago. It was originally a poem by a guy named Kent Keith, but then Mother Teresa got a hold of it and changed it a little bit. If you look at his original, Mother Teresa's is better. And it's called Anyway. And I read this sometimes when I'm discouraged. So I'm going to read it to you, and I hope it'll encourage you. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you'll win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. My prayer for you is that you'd have words that would encourage, inspire, and challenge people, and that you'd be able to, in your own life, speak those words of faith. When that station comes on in your mind that's negative, it's telling you you're useless, telling you you don't matter, telling you you'll never make it, that you'll change the channel to a channel of faith and understand, you know what? It's true. I can't do anything on my own, but as the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So learn to change the channel. Learn to spend time in God's Word. Learn to quote His Word. Understand that God's given you power through His Word to walk in faith. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that. I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to surrender your life to Him. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you've said some words. Maybe you got in a fight on the way here. Hey, there's forgiveness. You have to ask it though. So some of you on the way home may have to start with, I'm really sorry. And mean it. By the way, the way you mean it is to change. And then begin paying attention to the words you say. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for each one that's here. I pray that you'd bless them. Lord, may we have words of blessing and of faith to bless others. Lord, this time of year as people are struggling and people are downtrodden and some are just exhausted, I pray that we could bring words that build them up and encourage them even in their difficulty. Father, thank you. Thank you that you've given us that power. Thank you that you've given us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Normally we have